thank you so much for joining us, Leah. We can't wait to learn from you today. Prapatash, thank you so much, Rachel. Waniki sak na tasawis Leah wana ni na hanagansit na Thomas akudnasit na tay Louis Quisadat. Hello, everyone. My name is Leah. I'm a citizen of the Narragansett Indian Tribe here in Rhode Island. And uh, I grew up in the area of North Kingstown and I live in the Providence area today. Um, I am the community engagement specialist here at the Hafenreffer Museum of Anthropology. And I like, as Rachel said, I'd like to start uh, our program with a land acknowledgement, the Hafenreffer Museum. We have a land acknowledgement that we use uh, and we do this to acknowledge the uh, historical and contemporary indigenous communities who uh, lands we are seated on. So the Half and Refer Museum of Anthropology acknowledges that Brown University currently resides on my traditional homelands of the Narragansett people and the Wampanoag people who have stewarded this land through the generations. We recognize and, and respect their enduring relationships to this place in the past, present, and future. And everywhere that I go, I consider the ancestors of that place, the beings in creation, the land, and the indigenous people who may be residing there today. I'd like you to take a moment to think about where you are, who are the ancestors of that place, what beings are there in creation, and the land and the waterways, and what indigenous people are living in your community, and how can you be a good neighbor? Thank you so much. <laughs> we can't wait to learn from you today. So I'm gonna go off camera um, so that you guys can get a bigger view of Leah and get to learn from her. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rachel. So like I said, Waniki Suck, uh, today is a beautiful day. Um, we have nice warm weather. The dirt in my garden behind us is nice and warm. It's going to be a nice warm bed for the seeds that I'll be planting in the next few days. And we have these beautiful gifts of corn and beans and squash and sunflowers with us that we will be starting. Um, and you're going to help us start those off today. Um, the sun is shining. The the bugs are buzzing and we have a wonderful packed morning where we're going to be learning about uh, native gardening techniques or indigenous gardening, gardening techniques. Um, I've been gardening for some years and the plants that will be growing today are the traditional plants uh, of the northeastern native people and so there are different tribes in the northeast um, where i live and work and travel i it's narragansett territory as well as wampanoag territory sometimes i go up the road into nipmuc territory um, and so the the seeds that we are planting today are indigenous seeds to this area um, we have in your kits we have some strawberry popcorn we have sunflower seeds, we have some butternut squash seeds, and we also have cranberry beans. And they are called cranberry beans because they look like cranberries. I'm planting a very special type of corn that was given to me. Um, and I want to honor the, the people who have been growing this corn. This is known as Metacom's corn, sometimes known as King Philip's corn. And it's been told that this to me is a Wampanoag variety, this red corn here. Um, this is the corn that I have been growing the past few years in my garden and uh, in other places here in Southern New England. This is the Narragansett white cap flint corn. Um, and these corns are both flint corns, are, they're perfect for making flour, making cornmeal, if you like cornbread or corn muffins. Um, this is a perfect, uh, this is a perfect variety, perfect type. And this is our traditional seed, or these are our traditional seeds. And so I'll be sharing with you our traditional planting techniques. Um, you can always plant corn and off the instructions off the back of the packet and that will work too. We just have a very special way of growing corn. And traditionally in our societies, 
corn was typically grown by women in the community um, because women are considered life givers. And so they are responsible for growing the corn and the beans and the squash and the sunflowers and the strawberries and taking care of the nut groves and trees and the goose foot and Jerusalem uh, or sunchokes and um, many other types of native cultivars. And so um, my, my partner, um, he has been very kind and has turned my garden soil for me. He did that last weekend. Um, and if you can see very carefully, I'll try to adjust my computer screen here. I have four mounds and these, I'll try to move it a little bit. These are my corn mounds. And so when I plant corn, I plant the corn right in the mounds. And the corn is grown in mounds because it has a very shallow root system. Um, so the roots do not go very deep. They stay pretty shallow. So you have to build mounds to protect the roots. Corn also, if you didn't know, is a type of grass, believe it or not. Um, we think of corn as a vegetable because we see it in the vegetable section of our grocery store, but it's actually a grass, just like my grass here on the ground. If you look at the plant cam, um, corn came from a plant that was grown by indigenous women in the areas of central Mexico, and it was called Teosinte in over hundreds and thousands of years. The women carefully um, pollinated and cross-pollinated the corn to create many different varieties and many different colors. You can even buy rainbow corn. Um, so all corn is indigenous corn. It all came from the central area of Mexico. And our folks here in the Northeast, we have a story about how corn came from the Southwest. Now it's summertime and it's not the time to tell stories. We always tell stories in the winter time, but I will give you a gist of um, one day the people were very, very hungry and um, it, they asked for help from the creator and the, the creator sent um, different animals to help uh, the people. But, uh, and again, this is just the gist of the story, but it was Crow who flew far into the Southwest and he went into the creator's garden. He snuck right into his garden and he saw the beautiful corn plants and the beautiful beans. And he took a seed and of corn and he put it in one ear and he took a bean seed and he put it in the other ear and snuck out of the creator's garden and flew back to the Northeast and he dropped the seeds and gave them to the people. And so that's one of the stories of how we received corn and beans. And if you think about it very carefully, um, corn and beans, uh, they require pollination and birds are great pollinators. And the corn also came from that Southwest direction. Um, from where we believe the creator lives in the Southwest. And so uh, it makes a lot of sense, both scientifically um, and traditionally that that corn came from the Southwest. So like I said, these are just two varieties of corn. We're also growing beans. So I will show you a small handful of, uh, of these cranberry beans that I have. There are many different varieties of beans, but these are one of my favorites. And so we'll be growing those today. And then we will also be growing squash and the squash you'll be growing are butternut squash. This is the last butternut squash I have from my garden that I grew last year. And so I grew corn beans and squash. I grew a lot of other plants last year. You can see, see I still have some onions here in my garden and we have the, the squash. This is left over. My chickens pecked at the squash and it actually healed over, but squashes are really hardy and they're great winter food um, and they will winter over if you're careful. Um, so I could eat this and I might even eat this tonight. And you can see that we have some squash seeds right here. And you may have seen these, they look like pumpkin seeds because squashes and pumpkins are related. And then we have what some people call the fourth sister. And these are sunflower seeds. And these are the giant, what you have are the giant striped mammoth sunflowers. They grow really, really tall, about 13, 
Uh, they can grow up to about 13 or 14 feet tall. Last year, I think mine were about 10 feet tall. And they're just really, really beautiful seeds. And they're painted very lovely. Um, and I also have, if you want to see sunflower seeds, right on um, a seed pod, the, these are Hopi dye sunflowers, and they will actually create a beautiful blue dye. But we won't be planting those ones today because these are the beautiful seeds that you have. So I see that there's a poll question up. Do you know what the three sisters are? So if you can take a guess. And I'll tell you why they're called the three sisters. They're called the three sisters because the corn grows up nice and tall, really, really, really tall. And it allows for the bean to wrap around it. And the bean hugs that corn so tight and the bean has a very special job because corn takes a lot of nutrients out of the ground. It takes all the, the vitamins and or all the minerals out of the ground. And then the bean, it's called a nitrogen fixer. It What it does is it puts those nutrients back into the ground. And so it fertilizes, right? Sometimes you might have plants that you put fertilizer on. Well, if you grow corn and beans together, you don't need to fertilize your corn. The corn, the bean acts as a fertilizer and it wraps around that corn. And then the squash, that third sister, has big, big, big leaves. And this is any kind of squash. It could be butternut squash, it could be pumpkins, it could be um, zucchinis. They have the big, big leaves and they cover the ground and they create shade in between the mounds of the corn and this prevents the weeds from coming up and also because they have little pricklies on them on their tendrils and on their leaves it tends to keep little fuzzy animals out of the garden from from climbing your your corn and eating it so they all work together just as three sisters should work together um, and so this is, this is why we call them the three sisters and we, we grow them together consistently and it works really, really well. So I'm going to move my corn out of the way. You can see before I move it out of the way here, if you look at my computer screen, um, it's braided and this is a wonderful way of storing your corn. Now you're going to be growing popcorn so it's not going to be as long as this, but it will be red. And at the end of the season, um, when you pick it, um, if you have enough corn husk, you can braid it or you can just dry it out um, right on a cookie sheet um, so it doesn't get moldy or anything like that. And it will last a long time. So I hope everybody is ready to dig in the dirt move my squash out of the way. Now I have taken my corn seeds and my beans and I have soaked them. Um, I have a couple of floating beans here and these may or may not be great for planting. Sometimes they'll sprout, sometimes they won't. Um, typically when you eat beans you don't eat the ones that float but um, for planting we uh, I've had success planting floaty beans and I've not had success. That's why we're actually going to plant five seeds. And the reason for this is when you grow in a mound, you grow your corn. And what I'll do is I'll place, I'll pretend that my mound is right here. And you place your corn seeds in the north, south, east and west portion of your corn mound and then and when you transplant your plants this is how you should do it and then we always put a center one for the crow um, it's an offering to the crow as a thank you and this also is um an offering to any of the other animals because because sometimes they will come and they will eat your seeds that you just planted the day before they'll come in the nights um, or little woodchucks will come or when you have baby plants sometimes the animals will come and eat those baby plants so it's just adding an extra um, and so then you're going to plant your beans 
and it's hard to tell because my beans and my corn look very similar. In the northeast, southeast, southwest, and northwest corners of the mound. And then when we grow our squashes, we're going to plant them all around. And so when they start growing, you'll have different tendrils growing all around your mounds. So this would be one mound. Um, and then I have four mounds. So you imagine this planting pattern four times in my garden. It will probably be more. And then sunflowers, um, this is a preference. If you want sunflowers in your garden, you can plant them all around your mound if you wish. Um, but a lot of the time, I will plant them along the back edge of my garden because they make a nice wall, just like that. So that's a preference. But you can eat sunflower seeds. We made, we traditionally made oil out of sunflower seeds. So this is the method that we're using. I'm just going to move my seeds around because we are about to get dirty dirt. So I'm going to put my seeds back in. All right. So what you have are planting bags. Um, I'm using, I'm recycling these cups that we, that we had left over. Um, I always try to save my plastic cups um, or recycle them, but we had these left over from, uh, from an event quite a while ago. <laughs> um, and what I had done is I poked holes in the bottom. So you need to have a grown up help you poke holes if you're using a plastic cup, but you all have very nice uh, soft planting bags. So what you're going to do is you are going to take your planting bags and uh, or your little planting cups and you are going to fill them uh, three quarters of the way. So three quarters is just about here, right? And have a grown up help you fill them up. So I'm going to fill it. I have some nice dirt here. I have some nice comp, there's potting mix and compost in here. And I'm filling all my, all of my cups three quarters of the way. So this is the messy and fun part. Do one more. All right, so I'd say that's about three quarters. You can see if I tip it gently. And I'm just going to put it aside and just do a bunch more. So gardening is a really fun activity that all members of your family can do. I know that people said that they had grown a garden before and there's all different ways to grow a garden. You can grow a garden right in the ground, kind of like they do on a farm, or you can build a raised bed, which is what I have behind me. I live in a neighborhood and so a raised bed works well for me. You can have small raised beds or you can have big ones or you can use pots. So I have some pots that I will also be filling um, with plants in the season. Usually I like to put my tomatoes in my pots. Some people use bags. I've seen people use old, um, old kiddie pools or swim pools. And you can grow many different things. And plants are funny because some plants Oops, making a mess here. Uh, some plants really like to grow well together, like corn and beans. They grow great together. They're three sisters, um, corn, beans, and squash. But other plants, they don't really get along and they don't always get along. So I was always told you don't plant corn with tomatoes. So that's why I plant my corn inside and then I leave my tomatoes outside. Um, other things that grow well together that I have in my garden bed that's over there. I have some strawberries growing and strawberries are another native plant that we would cultivate. 
Um, and then I have spinach growing with my strawberries. So they get along really well. I also have some kale over there. And that's usually where I put my carrots because it's also nice and shady. So corn and beans and squash, they love to be in the full sun. They don't really like the shade, right? They won't grow very tall if you plant them in the shade. So try when you transplant your plants, which means putting them into the ground after you take them out of your, your cups um, or your bags, you want to put them in a nice sunny space. And you don't want to get them too wet. So plants are also picky, right? They don't like to have wet feet, right? So that means you don't want your, your dirt to be too soggy. You want your dirt to be just right. You don't want it to be too dry either. Think about what it's like when you're so thirsty, right? It's so uncomfortable. So we're just filling all of our planting bags because we are going to put one seed in each pot. So I see a question here and it says, what vegetables have you grown as a family? So think about that. What have you grown with your family? And feel free to put it in the chat. I know your hands are probably a little dirty right now, but that's okay. The dirt is good for you. I like, besides corn, beans, and squash, I love growing carrots. My son loves carrots. I like growing kale. I like growing spinach. Last year we grew spinach and Swiss chard. I like growing onions. Yes, tomatoes and zucchini. Zucchini is one of my favorites. I think I really like growing plants that are nice and big and fat and plump like eggplants. Even though I don't love to eat eggplants, I still like growing them and I like giving them away because I like picking them and I like feeling how warm they are in the sun when I pick them. Oh, somebody said cucumbers, sun sugar tomatoes, ground cherries, those are delicious. Another native cultivar strawberries and scallions. So we are approaching right now what we call the planting moon. Some people call it the flower moon and that's the full moon. It's usually the full moon in May and I call this the planting moon and um, so do many of my native community members because this is the time of the year when you plant your corn, your beans, and your squash. And if your parents follow what's called the Farmer's Almanac, which is an old guidebook to planting and they publish one every year, it tells you or it estimates for you when the last frost is going to be. And usually they say Memorial Day weekend is the time to plant. And I have to agree because here in Rhode Island, here in New England, you never know if it's going to get frosty. Tomorrow it's supposed to be 90 degrees, but later on this week it, at night, it's going to be in the 40s. And I heard up north, there's danger of frost and frost is really bad for your plants. So if you put, if you have plant babies growing, um, the frost is not good for them. It can, it can hurt them or kill them. Um, and so I always try to plant in the week leading up to and immediately after uh, the full moon. And Native people have been planting and living and using the moon as our calendar for thousands of years, like many cultures around the world. So we have 13 moons and these 13 moons each have a different activity associated with them, usually around food or harvest. And so this moon is the planting moon and we are planting at the full moon time or close to the full moon time. Um, in June, it'll be the strawberry moon. So if you ever, again, read the Farmer's Almanac, you'll hear about the different moons and many of them, pretty much all of them are based on native concepts or 
uh, Native ideas, or you could even say holidays. And these are times where we would come together and we would celebrate the harvest and the change in the seasons. We would celebrate the planting of corn or the arrival of the fish. So last full moon in, in April, we had the fish arrive, the herring. Um, and when the herring come, they come in big groups and they're these little, little fish. And traditionally our ancestors would harvest herring. We'd eat some of the herring, but also we would put the herring, we'd plant the fish right in our garden because the fish acts as a fertilizer. Now herring right now are protected and, and endangered and native communities have the right to harvest them, but we're also very careful in which we don't over harvest them. So for my garden, I can buy a fish for fertilizer and you can buy a fish fertilizer too. And it's kind of stinky, um, but you put it in this really cool hose nozzle and you will water your garden with it. And that has lots of nutrients. And so um, I, I guess I misspoke earlier when I said corn doesn't need fertilizer. We use the fish fertilizer for it, but the, the beans also act as that fertilizer too. So I'm sure everybody is elbow deep here in their dirt. We should have about 20 cups because we have five seeds each. I have a bug friend who wants to participate here. So as I, as I was saying before, the, the full moon in June is the strawberry moon. And that's the time when the strawberries will start ripening. And we will go out and we'll harvest and we'll have many songs and celebrations for the strawberry. The strawberry is the first berry. It's the leader of the berries. And we celebrate it because it really shows that this is now an abundant time. This is the time where we can relax a little bit and, and take it a little bit easier, right? We can go fishing, um, we can tend to our garden, we can harvest the strawberries, but it's not a time where we are desperate for food. And who likes strawberries? Strawberries are one of my favorite fruits. They're so sweet, especially wild strawberries or local strawberries. I mean, the ones you can get in the grocery store, I guess they'll do the trick, but I really prefer wild and local strawberries and things always taste so much better when they are grown in season. So my arm is getting tired from scooping some dirt. So I think I'm going to do a couple more we may not get through all of the all of the plant bags um, and filling them with dirt, but we'll do a couple more, and then I'm going to show you how to start planting. And it's really simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. We don't have to measure too much. One of the best ways working in your garden, especially if you've never really worked in a garden before. Some people will go out and they'll have a measuring stick. Um, but one of my, my favorite ways to measure is just by using my body parts. So I know the measurement of my, um, my thumb to my pinky, this is six inches. And I know that this is a foot here from my wrist to from my wrist to my elbow on the inside that's about a foot so if I need to plant things a foot apart I don't have to go get a measuring stick um, I just know what the measurement is for me here and it mostly works on grown-up arms and grown-up hands whereas with little hands it's a little more difficult but if you want you can grab a measuring tape at some point and you can measure what's the measurement from here to here Oh, this is 12 inches, perfect. I know I need to put my plants 12 inches apart. Um, or I know that from this finger 
to this knuckle is two inches. And, um, and so from this finger to just a little bit below for me is about an inch. And so this is what we're going to use to consistently measure the, the depth of certain seeds or the space between plants. It's a really great trick I learned from a farmer friend of mine, Keely Carlos. I have some friends here in my dirt. I have a little pill bug. I wonder if he can make an appearance on camera. I don't think he wants to. Oops, little roly poly bug. But these are our garden friends. I don't know, where did he go? There he is. These are our garden friends. And they're really good for the dirt, right? They, they break down, these guys will actually break down heavy metals in your dirt. Um, to touch them. I'm not really a fan of touching bugs, but he's up here and he's checking it out. And one of my favorite books to read to my four-year-olds is Up in the Garden and Down in the Dirt. And this this really explains the how or when to plant and the different things that we're doing when we're growing a garden. Um, it is not an indigenous book and I always love to promote indigenous books and um, maybe I one day will write an indigenous book about planting a garden um, with, with my son. Um, but I really love the book Up in the Garden and Down in the Dirt. And excuse me, the, the artist is, or excuse, the author is escaping my mind right now, but it is such a beautiful book. Um, another book while I'm waiting for everybody to kind of catch up on their dirt here. And this is my favorite book. And you may have seen a video of me reading this book, but this is called When the Shad Bush Blooms. I can put it right here. And it is my favorite book in the world. It's by P Carla Messinger and Susan Cates. And this is a beautiful book. I love the illustrations. And what it does is it shows what our people here in the Northeast looked like and were um, doing and dressing, but what they were doing traditionally and what we are doing now as contemporary families. So I just happened to open to this page and this is the, the, the planting moon, which is right now. So traditionally people would gather and they would plant corn and beans um, and work together in the garden. You can see the mounds here, the corn mounds. And then now, a lot of people will grow in rows, but uh, some families still plant corn and corn mounds like we do here. Um, and you can see there's a difference of 400 or 600 years, but we are still doing the same things. And this book is wonderful too, because it shows the different moons, the 13 moons. So the strawberry moon or the, here's another one. Um, the fishing moon. So it shows our ancestors and how they were fishing uh, traditionally and how we fish now. And I recommend buying this um, from, actually not from Amazon because Amazon does not carry it anymore, um, but from Oyate. And I can make sure that uh, Providence Children's Museum has that, uh, that information and uh, Oyate is a native run organization and they still have these books in print. Um, and so oh, I have another little garden friend. We have a little centipede type bug in here. Not great with <laughs> at identifying bugs, but these are all good friends that help out our dirt. So I think it's a baby centipede. We'll try to get him out of here because I just don't feel like poking him with my finger. Okay, so here is the fun part. What we are going to do is we are going to take one plant. Oh, thank you, Silver Moon. Nice to see you. Um, we are going to take one plant and or one seed and put it into the uh, into each cup, right? And so I'm going to start with corn because I just thought corn is the oldest sister. And we had soaked our seeds for just about 24, um, 12 hours, right, overnight. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm going to go to my second knuckle 
So one and a half to two inches, not too deep. We want it to be nice and warm and snuggly in its, in its little dirt bed, but we don't want it to be too deep because if we put it too deep, then it will struggle. It won't be able to break up through the dirt. It, a seed sparks and uses so much energy to try to reach, 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 reach for the sun. But if it's too deep, it uses all of that energy all at once and won't be able to grow. So we only just want to go down just a little bit. But the reason why we have all this dirt is because once it does reach for the sun, it's doing a seed grows and it's doing this. I know you can't really see me, but it puts its roots down and then it puts where its leaves will become its stock up. So it's stretching. And if you wanna take a minute and you wanna take your hands and, and pretend to be a seed, you're all sleepy and snuggly in your nice warm bed of dirt. And then you feel the warmth and you know there's sunshine and you feel the moisture and you wake up and you say, I'm going to grow. And you stretch your arms really, really far and one arm's going down here and one arm's going way up and you reach towards the sun, that's just like a seed, right? And so we are going to take our seed or our, our planting cup and I'm going to take my finger and I'm just going to put it in right to my second knuckle and make, oh, and here we go, make a hole, right? And you can see a little hole right in there. Again, you can see I went right to my second knuckle and I'm going to take my corn seed. I'm just going to put her right in. There she is. You say, wake up seed, it's time to grow. And you gently just put the warm, nice warm dirt over her, right? You don't pack it down tight. You just gently cover it. And what you need to do is you need to put it aside in an area where you know, okay, these ones have seeds in it because you don't want to mix up with the cups you haven't planted. So I'll do another corn so people can see. So I'm going to go up to my second knuckle right there. Oops, I messed that one up. <laughs> I hit my cup by accident. So I'm going to go again, right down to my second knuckle and I'm going to take another corn seed. I'm going to put her in and I'm going to have good thoughts about this corn seed and we'll say, please grow seed, it's time to wake up. And I just put the seed right in and gently just cover it with a little bit of dirt and put it aside. So we'll just keep doing this. I'll do a couple more corns Again, into your second knuckle, just about as a grown up, or for a little kid, maybe a whole thumb, depending on how old you are. And then pop that seed right on in. Pop! Time to grow seed. And then we just cover her right up and say, go to sleep, or wake up rather. <laughs> We're tucking you in, but it's time to wake up. It's the spring. And we'll do couple more. So we're doing five corn, right? One for the north, one for the south, one for the east, one for the west, and one for the crow. Right corn, pop, time to grow seed. Nice and snuggly in that little, in that little bed. All right, and we'll do my fifth one here. All right. All right. Thank you, seed. It's time to grow. Pop. Cover her up. Set her aside. All right. So those were our five corn seeds. So the beans, now the beans, you're going to do exactly the same thing. And so beans will actually grow pretty quickly. 
If you've ever done a cool bean project in school, I remember doing a bean project in the third grade where we took, I think they were butter beans, and we put them on a paper towel in a plastic bag and we put them in the window and we could watch how they grew. And so for my grown-ups here, I remember back to college plant biology. Corn is a monocot. It's a grass. Um, so when it sprouts up, it just, it sends its root down, but it sends up one stalk. And beans are a dicot, which means they send their root down, but then they come up and they have two leaves, dicotyledons. A little bit of science for you. So again, corn is a grass. And here's our beans. And we're just popping them right on in the same exact way. Time to grow seeds. So I'm just going to do one more bean seed because I have more cups that I have to fill. So we pop our, our bean in and you can see the beans got nice and wrinkly once we started soaking them. Now what this does, what the soaking does is it softens that outside and it kind of wakes them up just a little bit. All right, so now we're going to do our squashes. We'll do the exact same thing. So I'll take my squash seed, oops, I'll put it right in. And this is like a, a easy one you can see. Now it's good to label them um, if you really want to know what's growing, but I mean, I, all, I just plant them all at the same time and I know what they look like when they pop up. They have very specific looks. Again, corn will pop up and it'll just be that one stalk. Um, and then the beans, they'll have two. And then squash has a very specific look and so, does sun, so do sunflowers when they start popping up. You just pop it right in. Good night, little seed. All right. And then we'll do our, our sunflowers, right? Same thing. Now what you can do after you've planted is we're going to do a very, very light and gentle water. We do not want to give these plants too much water right now because we don't want them to drown. So we will just do a very gentle water on them. Right. And then my last one, because I've run out of cups. But this is something you can keep doing even after we get off our little Zoom here. And you can put these inside. I would suggest putting them inside in a sunny area. My sunny area is right next to the kitchen table. And it'll take a few days for them to germinate and pop up. And when you move them outside, you want to move them out on a nice warm sunny day, um, but you want to put them in the shade and you want to acclimate them to the weather. Another thing that you can do is you can direct seed right into your mound, right into the ground. And the way I direct seed or the way I build a mound is I just take a shovel and I scoop up a nice big pile and then a nice and quick tip is you take a five gallon bucket and you just tamp it down and that makes your mound nice and flat on top because if you don't flatten your mound on top all the water is going to rush down and wash your seeds out so you need it nice and flat right on top like a little platform and then um, we in our family because we have little critters who like to come and visit our garden. We have these chicken wire hats. And this is something that a grown up has to do, but you take two five gallon buckets and you put a piece of chicken wire in between them. And then you push one five gallon bucket onto the other one and it's going to make this top hat shape. So once your corn babies start poking up because I have squirrels who will go right into my garden. This is, ba this is mainly my bunny fence. This keeps the bunnies out and the groundhogs out. 
but the squirrels will get in, um, sometimes birds will get in. And so we put these top hats right on top of the corn until they reach the top of this chicken wire and it protects, it protects them from little munching friends in the garden. But because you are starting your seeds in here in these cups, then we will be um, transferring them when they're when they're bigger. So we're going to wait until these plants are about a hand high, right, like that, and then we can transfer them out. Um, and that's mostly for the corn. And once your 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 squashes will be ready once they have the the bigger squash leaves, right? You So when squashes grow up, they have these two cute little leaves, um, but then after a couple of weeks, they'll get a bigger leaf. So you will probably transplant your squashes after you transplant your corn and your beans. You can transplant your corn and your beans. Um, when your corn gets to be a hand high, you can put them right into your, into your mound or right into your garden or into your pot. Um, see, when you have a pot, you don't have to do a mound. Um, and say you only have pots available, what you can do is if you have four pots, you can put one corn and one bean in a pot, um, one corn and one bean in another pot. So you do that for all four of your corn and beans. Um, and then you can put them in that northwest or, or excuse me, north, south, east, west direction. And then you can put pots of your squashes all around um, if you only have that available to you. So now I am just going to use this water because it's a little dirty. Let me take my seeds out so I don't pour them all over the place because I have a couple of seeds left. And I'm going to carefully water, very carefully, water my plants. And, and I'm gonna make a little mess here, but I'm just giving them a little bit just to moisten the soil because I do not want to flood them, right? So parents, I would say a quarter of a cup or less is ideal just to moisten that soil. And then depending on if they're getting dried out, once they start, once the dirt starts looking a little bit dry, then you can add some more water. So maybe that's every day for you, or maybe that's every other day. It's going to depend on the weather. But that was actually the perfect amount of water for all of my cups. Now, it's time for them to grow. So it's a great time to ask questions. Um, I think Rachel's going to help us ask some questions and I think she has some questions for me too. Um, and I, just a reminder to use the chat function, but I just want to say Katapatanamu, thank you all very much for planting with us and may your plants grow and may you enjoy them and enjoy your popcorn and your beans and your squashes. Your squashes should be ready around the time school starts or just after um, mid-September. Mid um, your corn should be ready a little bit earlier. Yeah, thank you so much, Leah. I've learned so much just from watching you plan today and learning from this project. And I want to just give you and the Heaven Rapper a big thanks for joining us today and helping us learn from you and being part of our community. Um, so yes, if, like Leah said, if you'd like to ask questions, please feel free to add them into the chat and we will answer them the best that we can in the few minutes that we have remaining. Um, while you guys are taking the time to go into the chat, um, I just have a few questions for you, Leah. Um, one of the things that I'd love to know is how did you become um, an engagement coordinator at the Heffenreffer and how that like builds into your career? Sure. So my job is very special. Um, I It's my job 
to work with Leah Bergen in our education department and the rest of the museum to build bridges between the museum and the local indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. um, it's also my job to work on our outreach programs and develop new programs. And so I have worked in museums for over 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. So my path, I actually left high school and I get a museum internship right away at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum um, because I was really interested in teaching and learning about my own culture and the cultures of my neighboring tribal nations. And so I worked there for a number of years. Um, then as I was older, I went to college and completed my undergraduate degree at the University of Rhode Island in anthropology. Um, but all the while I have worked with different museums in the New England and Northeastern region, um, representing native people and uh, communities and, cult and our cultures and teaching people and helping them learn about, about our folks and what we have done traditionally in our history and our culture, but what we do as contemporary people too. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, another question I had is how could, um, what advice would you have for families that wanna learn more about the Hep and Raffer or about engaging with the indigenous communities um, in Rhode Island and the area? Sure, so um, you can visit our website um, and that is, you, or you can Google the Haffenreffer Museum and we can pop a link right in there for you. Um, something that is a wonderful resource that I was happy to help create is called This Land is Home. And this is a, a completely virtual module that looks at New England and Northeastern indigenous people and it is from the voice of indigenous people because we use videos of indigenous people all speaking and sharing a piece of their um, their knowledge with the audience and also um, it engages with some of the materials that we have in the collection at the Half and Refer Museum. I also want to give a plug to our partners, the Tomaquag Museum. Um, and they are the are they are Rhode Island's only indigenous museum. And I highly recommend that uh, you can visit the Tomaquag Museum's virtual programs and find out more about visiting with the museum. I'm not sure um, now that museums are starting to reopen the summer. Um, you can find out more information there, but I have to give a plug for them um, because they are uh, Loren and Silvermoon and the other staff there. They are from my Narragansett community, but they are wonderful friends. And oh, thank you, Silvermoon. Silvermoon um, is uh, is over over at the Tomaquag Museum, and she says that they are back open in June. And so we really love working with them at the Half and Refer, and I love working personally with them too. Excellent. Thank you so much for all that information. Um, another question I had is, um, I know that the Half and Refer is closed now, but if, um, do you guys have any advice for families that might want to engage with you in the future, where they can look, or any programs coming up? Absolutely. So you can check our website, which um, is hma.brown.edu. Um, and you can check our events calendar. We encourage you to sign up for Half and Ref for Headlines, which you will get a monthly, um, we only send them once a month, uh, a, um, an email that's talking about what's going on at the museum and gives you information about when we will be reopening. We have, um, we are on Brown's Green and Manning Hall. And you can connect with us also through membership, uh, which is a really wonderful way. And our membership program helps you to also get into different museums throughout the country through the ASTC organization. We will be having um, summer programming. I will be doing a fish skin tanning demonstration, which I'm really excited about. And so I'll be making leather out of fish skins. And you'll be able to learn more about that. And we hope to have some other programs coming to you as well this summer. And then usually our fall, we're pretty packed with programs too. And they're all, right now, they are all virtual. So we've been able to, to host virtual programs for going on a year now. And it's been great. 
Yeah, that sounds super exciting. I might have to check out some of those myself. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so we have about a minute left. If any of our guests want to include a question in the chat, you're more than welcome to. Um, otherwise, I'm just wondering, one of the questions we like to ask at the museum is we're really big on creativity. And we're just curious about what ways are you creative in your career and in, um, yeah, and at the Heffern Refer in general. Wow. Um, so that's a great question. Um, I dabble in a little bit of artwork. And so I try to put some of my artwork into the work that I do. But I'm also because of that, I'm really conscientious of other indigenous artists mm -hmm. and trying to promote their work and their knowledge and their contributions. And so we've been doing that through our virtual programs and workshops and um, trying to connect the, the, the people who attend half and of her programs to these phenomenal artists. Um, and also, I, I, I guess I would say some of my other creative um, talents would be writing and I really love to write. So I, I am in like the perfect job. So I can, I can do a lot of writing here and write our programs and it's, it's just been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that information with us. That's super exciting to hear about all of the um, creative ways that you engage with your community and to learn about ways that you're creative yourself. It looks like we're out of time, but um, guests, you are welcome to co um, continually ask questions to me early. I know Leah included her email in the chat. Um, and I will be sending out a resource guide for you um, in a few minutes. You'll get an email from me. It'll have the planting guide that I sent out yesterday and in addition, um, some reading resources as well. Um, so if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to answer them for you. Thank you so much. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for attending Katapatanamu. Thank you all. And again, if you have questions throughout the growing season, um, you say, oh no, um, something came and ate my plants. What do I do? Or when do I pick my corn? Feel free to email me. Um, I know it's a lot of information to take in right now. And sometimes you just have to let things grow and it's all a learning experience. But the planting guide will help you transplant your, um, your seeds, and uh, in the fall we, or the early fall, we can definitely help you harvest your popcorn. So I hope you really enjoy it all. It's going to be delicious. And I just have wonderful memories of, of having popcorn with my family that we made right on the stove. It's much different than a microwave. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to try that out. Thank you so much. And if anybody has um, wants to go back, we'll, we're recording this webinar and we will be putting it on our um, social media channels and on YouTube in the coming week or so.